Hey, everybody, this is the franchise Shane Douglas, the greatest wrestler in the history of professional wrestling, just saying, Philadelphia, get ready to go back to the extreme on April 28th. When you want the best and most low down on professional wrestling, you want it right here at IYHWrestling.com. These are the boys to get it from. <laughs> Take it from me. All right, we're back here, and we are joined by Tony Mamalute, mm-hmm. Extreme Rising. How are you doing, my friend? I am great. Thank you for asking. Cool. That's all we have time for. <laughs> <laughs> I want everyone to check out ExtremeReunion.net. You can find out all the information about all the stuff that's going on. You guys got a big show coming up in November. You guys are going back to Philly. And uh, I know you've been there so many times and stuff, but is there is there like a special feeling when you're wrestling in Philly? Or is it oh, like any place yeah. else? Mm-hmm. No, it's it's very different because it's, the the requirements in order to to please the fans is a much higher level. So it's always a treat to go there because you know you're going to be challenged by them, and so therefore you have to challenge yourself. So anytime I get to wrestle in front, especially when I'm doing it in front of what you consider maybe an ECW esque crowd, it's even more enjoyable because it brings back a lot of those old memories. Mm-hmm. How long do you think it took you to like really? Uh get like uh connected with the crowd there because you know they there a lot of times they're not accepting a new people when you come into fbi it's already established group like how long did you think it took before like they really accepted you uh well you know philly is backwards in the way they accept a lot of people usually it's profound booing met with disdain and hatred so uh-huh. that i pretty much picked up on right away as far as actually getting cheered uh well you know, it helped to have Guido and Big Sal, so it didn't take that long necessarily, but it certainly wasn't the easiest crowd. Maybe a couple shows, three, four. Yeah. You know, we're still we're still getting that just hatred and booing, and we've been doing the show for seven years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think we got we got to do something. <laughs> like internal issue at that point. <laughs> <laughs> no, something that always stuck out uh, to me about you was uh, when doing the FBI and whatever was uh, you were really skinny and you could fit through the guardrails. Was uh, that? <laughs> <laughs> did you find that out, like, by accident, or, like, how how did you uh, come up with that spot? Oh, uh, no, I've always known I was skinny. No, huh. uh, <laughs> that that was more of one of those kind of, you know, kind of genuine, organic moments that just kind of happens in wrestling, um, and it just did, you know. It wasn't anything, you know, that's the beauty of wrestling is when it is done with, you know, it isn't quote-unquote choreographed, it was the, a unique situation that uh, maybe will never be done again. Hopefully, for anyone's sake. <laughs> the, you yourself, though, when you when you like when you joined the uh, the FBI, did you feel uh, how long was it for you that you felt like you were part of the group, or did you feel like there was chemistry right away? Well, the chemistry was it was right away. You, you know, the funny thing about it is when I was just a fan, and even before I was in the business. You know, the first time I ever saw Little Guido on TV was the night that ECW invaded Monday Night Raw, and, you know, that was a treat. And, uh, you know, I kind of fashioned myself in the direction and, and the outline of, you know, of his character, oddly enough. And to, so, I mean, I kind of knew what was the deal going into it because I was an FBI fan, and then it just, you know, the natural chemistry uh, from the heavens, so to speak, just kind of worked itself out just fine. You know, I you know the best thing that ever happened in my career was getting fired from WCW so that I could have the uh, amazing opportunity of you know being in ECW and tagging with Little Guido. I mean that was kind of my you know I guess quiet little dream, and I actually got to live it ironically enough. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, being a smaller guy and stuff, I don't think it's so much of a big deal right now. But uh, did anyone like try to discourage you, say you know you should get into this? Um, well, it, my parents, uh, most notably, uh, anyone who has rational thought would think that a kid <laughs> breaking into the business at 120 pounds really should at best be a referee, at most be, you know, a, a referee, and, uh, the, you know, it would be crazy, quite frankly, to, uh, to do this. The only person who never really discouraged me on any level was, uh, was, was, uh, my idol and trainer, Dean Malenko. He, he never once said, hey, you're too small to do this. He just taught me how to wrestle. We never discussed, you know, making big money because I wasn't really my goal anyway. All I ever really wanted to do was really kind of 
have kind of a fantasy camp about it, the whole thing, and it just kind of snowballed onto itself into, I guess, a meteoric rise to fame on a needless level. So, you know, uh, it, it, it is what it is, you know, and uh, after a while I had to accept the fact I wasn't going to be a big guy, so it just became my gimmick. Yeah. Did Dean train you at uh, WCW? No, uh, he had a, a school that originally was opened by his father and then carried on after his dad had passed away in 1994 in Tampa, Florida. A lot of guys went there uh, who have made it in the business of, you know, uh, Mark Merrill uh, would be one. Kane was another guy that passed okay. through that system. You know, uh, uh, Bart Gunn went there. He was a shooter. You know, uh, Van Vampiro or Gangrel, if you will, and a lot of other guys. Uh, told the line in the Malenko camp uh, in the <clears throat> in the 16 years that it was open. Mm. Hmm. Well, once you uh, made it in, in wrestling, uh, and you, you know you were in uh, WCW and, and ECW and stuff, that was was he proud of you? Did he say anything? You know, once you were in the business. Well, you know, you got to understand Malenko's pr- perspective on the business. He's been in it for now 50 odd years. You know, if you consider him growing up around it as a kid. So he just celebrated, I believe, his 52nd birthday just a few days ago. So uh, praise never would come quickly or to your face from Malenko, but he wasn't necessarily a negative guy by any means. But uh, you could tell that the guys, when they made it from his camp, it, obviously that's to make him feel, you know, a bit of pride because that's his, you know, that's him in in, in a reflection of him uh right there i'm sure sean michaels would say the same with some of the great talent that he produced in uh, a much shorter period of time you know when you give the when you give the ability and the skills and the gift of wrestling to someone and they can take it and, and make something of it that would make me prideful so but no he never actually said anything necessarily that would consider itself to be a praise mm-hmm. let's see are we going to call on the line 513 area code who are you my name is melvin Melvin. Yes. You have a question for Tony Mamaluke? Has he ever wrestled in WWE before? <laughs> <laughs> that one you could well, have up on, like, uh, you could have Googled that one, Melvin. Somebody is peppering me with text messages. I can't imagine who it is. Um, if I can answer that question, yes, I did. Uh, maybe not to the extent to which I like to certainly... Not as far as on TV exposure, but yes, I did work for Vince McMahon uh, in the reincarnation of ECW. Anything else there, Melvin? Um, who do you, who do you wrestle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give uh, us I some think, fascinating <laughs> questions, Melvin. He really should probably switch to caffeinated coffee. <laughs> um, nobody would know, honestly, but two guys that were actually pretty talented. One was... Uh, uh, Ke- uh, Sean, uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Sean O'Reilly, mm-hmm. Ryan O'Reilly. I'm sorry. Oh, I know. Yeah, sorry. I know. That is, yeah. Ryan O'Reilly and uh, and Derek Nightkirk were the team that we worked every single night. We ended up having some really uh, very fun and good matches that even the older guys would have respected. Um, unfortunately, it never translated to TV, which often happens when you're not in favor with the uh, you know the right people in that group. Yeah. You've worked for just about every company. Do you consider yourself lucky that you got in the door at WCW before it, like, went out of business? To be honest with you, I consider myself lucky having moments just like this. I mean, the fact that a kid from upstate New York who is limited in athletic skills, uh, you know, was obviously undersized and anyone cared to even pay enough attention to realize I was around, I find that pretty fascinating. I guess I never lost my perspective on what and who I am. Um, you know, it is pretty exciting that, you know, fans who I will maybe never meet actually know my name on some level, at least my professional level. I mean, it's pretty exciting that I even, you know, very few people in life get to live their dream. Uh, I was, I, I as often say, I, I kind of forced gump my way through wrestling, and, uh, you know, that's, just how I've always approached it in order to keep my sanity. So I I feel perfect every time that somebody wants to, you know, acknowledge my existence. So it's always fun. Mm -hmm. Now, are you aware who you uh, you guys are wrestling on the November 17th show? 
Uh, you know, honestly, I don't know right now. Uh, they, sometimes the cards are, tend to be up in the air with trying to put together the best card possible. Mm-hmm. If I had to pick uh, a team to work, I, I'd like to, you know, either Blackout, which I think is a lot of fun, uh, but they look like they got their hands full with, uh, you know, New Jack and Mustafa, or, of course, the Dramatics one more time, which I think we just barely scratched the surface with where that can go. So, um and of course the BWO, well, mm. in whatever combination of cir- circumstances that lands up on, on being with either Balls Mahoney or you know Blue Meanie or even, <clears throat> even Rodman too. So a- any combination of those three teams would be fun, or maybe somebody new that we're not aware of. So, yeah. Yeah. so anyway, one I know for sure we don't all be ready. That's for sure. <laughs> All three of those would be really different uh, styles, I think. You know, the one's going to be like a hardcore match where you guys are probably getting hit with a lot of weapons. One would be a comedy fun match, and then one would be a really high-flying, like, technical match. Do you have any preference there, or are they all fun for you? Uh, you know, I've never been one that likes to lean myself toward direction of hardcore, mm-hmm. just because that's, I, you know... I often often joke that I was classically trained in the art of professional wrestling, so it's not that I don't appreciate that. In fact, I was a huge ECW fan and certainly understand how that's a very difficult way to make a living, but I don't necessarily choose to do that style because, well, it's just not what I do. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, that doesn't mean I won't if I have to. God knows I've been in enough fights in my life. But (laughs) that's a whole other conversation. (laughs) But, uh... You know, I you know I like to, I love my favorite guys to work are actually high flyers because they can fly all around when they get down on the mat. I'm going to choke them out or tap them out or mm-hmm. make them cry to the mama. So you know that's what I like. Yeah. What do you think about Shane's uh, decision to stay out of the ring, Shane Douglas? You know, from a fan perspective, I was a Shane Douglas fan. Uh, again, I was just a dumb wrestling fan who just fell into the business. So I was a fan of Shane Douglas, you know, especially during his ECW period when he was, the, you know, the world champion on multiple occasions. So on a fan perspective, I certainly felt saddened that, you know, he felt that maybe this was an appropriate time because, you know, I'm a fan of his. Uh, from a professional standpoint, I don't think it really changes that many things, really, to be honest with you. He's still Shane Douglas. He's still probably going to go out there and, and give a hell of a promo, and you're still going to get the franchise in a, just a, a slightly toned-down version, for lack of a better term. I don't know if it really uh, constitutes any necessary huge shakeup in the lineup. It just it actually allows for more people to wrestle on the show, and you still get Shane Douglas. So that, to me, is is a is a win-win for everybody. Mm-hmm. See, are we got um do you think things would have turned out differently for that first uh, show if um if they hadn't change had to get a different person in for the main event? Well, any any show that you're going to do and you advertise something, I don't care what company you you're talking about, WWE included, and mm-hmm. and and it changes for circumstances beyond the control of the promoter. Hence why it always says on the bottom of a card to card subject to change. That's definitely going to hurt your business. Uh, it's like anybody running any other kind of business and they advertise something and you go for that specific thing and you don't get it, you're going to be turned off. So the only thing you can do is, as a promoter, as a business owner, is try to make up for it. And I think, I know that Shane and Kevin and all the guys, uh, you know, definitely took that to heart, that they had to re reimburse those those fans that more or less were disappointed in some level uh, on the last show. And that's all you can do because you can't change history. You can't change circumstances. Mm-hmm. So, yes, it did hurt, but I think they tried their best to, to you know, give back to those who were unfortunately misled uh, to believe that they were going to see something else. Mm-hmm. Well, what did you think of uh, of the reaction from the crowd for your guys' match? Because uh, it seemed like everyone was really into it. Uh, as far as the first show goes. Yeah, the first show. <laughs> you know, Stevie and I... Uh, on a personal level, we're, we're friends, and, uh, and I, I'm, I'm privileged to say that because he's a, a hell of a guy. But we both felt that we understandably went into that match with the with the outline of where we were fitting into the card, 
and not trying to do so much as to take away from those who were coming later. And if we would have known how, honestly, the show was going to turn out, then it would have been a whole different style of match with a a lot more um, wrestling-based storylines as opposed to the classic FBI, BWO, ha-ha stuff, mm-hmm. which obviously there's a time and place for that, but if we would have known better, then we would have saved that for another time and another place. So we were a little disappointed, but what can you do? Mm-hmm. Are there any uh, older FBI members that uh, you, you would like to see come back for a show? Uh, I was always well, a big, big fan Sal. of uh, A big Sal, or... Big Sally Graziano, because uh, to be honestly, when you have the FBI, a combined weight of slightly under 400 pounds, but then you have the ultimate equalizer in a 600-pound Italian monster, that's where we get over, mm-hmm. and that's what we need, mm-hmm. especially for working a heel style of match, which undoubtedly we will be, because we just don't know anything else. As yeah. much as we like to sell pictures after the show <laughs> or during it, for that matter, we're we're just by nature and, and always will be heels. Mm-hmm. So we need six hundred pound monster. Yeah, what, what's it like um, for some of the, you know have like uh, this like real legend with you guys like, and then he's like doing a comedy thing like the Big Don is there with you and was that ever like you just like stop and think you know this guy was like uh, you know former NWA champion and now he's he's uh, having a lot of fun with us here. Uh, you know, well, honestly, I, you know, I didn't get into the group until after that particular era oh, yeah, okay. ran ran its course. Uh, I came in when Guido was kind of in the midst of his three way dances mm-hmm. with uh, Tajiri and Super Crazy, and, and stick somebody else in there if you need to. But that said, uh, it certainly was interesting. The one time I did experience that when. You know, I actually have tagged with Tracy Smothers on some independent shows throughout the South yeah. a time or two, but which was fun and very easy. <laughs> what a great way to make a living. <laughs> you never get hurt. But uh, it was interesting when we did the, uh, well, I think it was a one-night stand pay-per-view where, you know, we had just about everybody, every FBI member you could pull out of the, out of the, uh, out of the hat and call mm-hmm. to the, call to the, to the, uh, call to arms, so to speak. Uh, J.T. Smith included. So that was oh, really blue fun. Eyes. Mm-hmm. That was really a fun experience. So I guess, you know, it's interesting to think of, yeah, I mean, you, you're talking about a former world champion who's now a manager for, uh, you know, a ha-ha tag team. It's just funny how the world of wrestling kind of yeah. kind of just goes full circle, so mm-hmm. to speak. That was actually probably my uh, – he, he probably wouldn't like this, but that was actually the one I enjoyed him the most. So. Oh, uh, Okay. <laughs> But uh, let's see, we got uh, Jack Collard on the line. Hi, Tony, how you doing? Hey, man, what's up? Uh, not much. All I've got is a question for you. Is, do you have any Scotland regrets? Uh, Scotland. Okay, cool. Do you yeah, have any, I'm sorry? Do you have any regrets from back in the day? Do you have any regrets, like any opportunities that you saw missed that possibly you could have been in a sort of angle with some guy or something that you maybe wanted to do that you never got the opportunity to do? Is there any sort of thing there? Uh, yeah, I, I get you know, that, that's a really, really good question. That's a very interesting question to ask. If I had to say one regret that I wish I, I definitely have is the I my approach and kind of the way I viewed my separate runs in Ring of Honor, if I would have approached it with a more in the moment as opposed to using that as a way to kind of get ready for WWE, I think I would have actually been able to flourish there and uh, maybe not taken that WWE route, which was a good and unique opportunity, but um, I think I could have probably gone farther and done better if I would have approached Ring of Honor with a more, this is where I need to be, this is what I need to be doing, and this is an outlet I can have to kind of really get my name out there after ECW closed. So I wish I would have taken Ring of Honor, not to say more seriously, but uh, taken it for more for what it really was as opposed to what I thought it was. So, so I guess ten, Ring of Honor would be my one regret. So to enhance your character, you thought maybe... If you worked a wee bit harder in Ring of Honor to enhance your character before you actually return to mainstream television? Uh, another good question. Uh, well, you know, the thing about Guido, 
and I love the guy, but he's a big star, you know, compared to me. He really is. I mean, you know, every tag team has their Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty. I certainly would fit into the Marty Jannetty half of the tag team. Uh, and that's not taking away from Marty Jannetty at all, but Shawn Michaels is what, maybe the greatest wrestler of all time. So I think Ring of Honor, if I would have taken a more uh, concentrated approach, I could have stepped out from the shadow that is Little Guido and kind of made Tony Mamaluke stand on his own a little bit more and then allowed myself the opportunity to kind of really not be Guido's partner but be Tony Mamaluke of the FBI, so to speak. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for calling in, Jack. No problem. Let's see here. We got... Uh... What time? I wonder what time it is in Scotland. Are you still on there? What time is it in Scotland? Um, it's 2.04 a.m. All right, cool. Is it time to get a drink? <laughs> uh, I've had enough for them tonight. <laughs> but I think it's time for another. You have a nice night, Tony. Thank you very much, Jack and Wanich. Have a nice one. Thank you, man. Uh, let's see. We got uh, Jimmy Jams on the line. James. James, you got a question? It's shocked into awe. <laughs> I guess not. We are losing dreams. Thank you for calling in. Uh, Ultimate Beef in the chat room, he wanted to know, uh, was it fun to work with uh, Big Vito and Disco Inferno in WCW? Um, I guess. I mean, that was... <laughs> <laughs> You're not convincing us. <laughs> uh, that was a very difficult time in my life on a personal <laughs> level. And on a physical level, um, and a professional level, all at the same time. So, uh, my fondest memories of WCW was the day that James J. Dillon called and told me I didn't have to come to work anymore because <laughs> I suck. Was um, that was that the reasoning he gave you? Or? No. Well, he they checked, they fired me because I was injured. Then they released me from doctor's care and then subsequently let me go because they couldn't in, in good conscience fire someone that was hurt. Mm -hmm. So the moment that I was cleared by their doctor, they said shortly after Christmas in the year of 2000 and uh, 1999, well, I don't even care anymore. But anyway, it, they told me to go hit the bricks kid. And then I certainly did. So I went from being on WCW television to the next week being a bouncer at the biggest gay bar in Atlanta, Georgia. That was an awkward experience, which I didn't even know what the hell that was all about, but there I was. Mm -hmm. Did you ever run into Incher there? Yeah. Did, did no. you know, yeah. No. That, actually, that's the place where I first met Rey Mysterio. Really? Was he a patron, or what was going on there? Uh, well, it was a very unique club in the fact that they call it gay, but it was just anyone who liked to do drugs. That's not counting with Mysterio. <laughs> See, just Jack, I could have fell night. into that. It, uh, that know, is not Ray Mysterio I'm talking about, but they, right. that's where everybody went to get. It was a terrible place. It was the dredges of all, the, the worst parts of humanity. But I tell you what, I learned more in that period of time that I worked in that wretched place than anywhere I've ever been in my life. So actually it was a very good life experience, and a haunting one at that. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any? Did you get in any? Uh, you know, as a bouncer, did you have to get in any fights or anything while you're working there? God, I got in so many fights, I forgot how many fights. <laughs> any of them stand out? Uh, one time, actually, funny that you bring up the uh, the big veto, but Johnny the Bull, who lived in Atlanta, used to go to the club all the time because you know it, it, on the upstairs where I worked, that's where the straight people went, uh -huh. and. Uh, so he would come in all the time. Uh, he told me about it before I ever worked there. And uh, one time I was fighting this guy, and I tripped over a chair, and I fell on the ground, and Johnny the Bull was there, and he just he just choked this little bastard. I'm sorry, he just choked this kid right out. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you know, like the one time that I was going to shine is being a tough guy, and then Johnny the Bull once again has to save me. So... And just all, my whole life goes around back. <laughs> uh, Let's see, we got, uh, James, are you going to try this again? Can can you speak up? I think you got the wrong person. All right. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I fooled you guys. It's Yolanda. I'm calling from my computer today. All right, well, Yolanda. Hi. I think she's just calling from James' house. We got a little hook. I ain't calling from his I ain't calling his damn house. He wish he could be so lucky. Um, <laughs> Hi, Tony. How are you? 
I am great. How are you, Miss? I'm fantastic. Um, I, I, the, when, you, when you called, I, I had the. I know everybody else talk about ECW and then WCW and Extreme Reunion and all that good stuff or Extreme Rising, but I, I, I don't think people know that you were in UWF. Oh yes, yes. And, One of the and, uh, experiences I've had in a while. <laughs> and I, I went. I was at the. Let me see which uh, John was it? Uh, uh, Club Amnesia, the New York yes. uh, taping. And That's why um, no one can remember it. <laughs> <laughs> and now I haven't seen it in a long time. You know what I mean? So when and all of a sudden I, I see, I, 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 I see, I see this, this this handsome Italian man wrestling, and 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 you know he's he's slim, but he but he got muscles and he's diesel and 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 stuff. And, and I was like, well, who's that? And everybody's talking about Luke. I'm like, no way. And you look amazing, number one. And two, I mean, did you did you lose a bet? Like, like how did uh, like how did you even get in, into that situation of, of you know wrestling and in, in that extreme? You know, what I mean, um, the, the, I, how can I say this? Oh, God, I'll keep it real. There's I think I get your stuff. point. No, I understand There's what you're saying. Thing, you know what I mean, like, some, some hood grimy stuff. Like, how the hell did your ass get in this, basically? Well, I mean, when when you talk about the hood and you talk about street warfare, right, I mean, right. obviously the first guy you're going to think of is Tony Mamalu because there's Word. no one more extreme mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and hardcore than Tony. No, in all seriousness, that just <laughs> kind of happened. Um, honestly, when going into that day was very, uh, you know, they wanted me to, to be a character that would fit in line with their, their particular approach to the business, which was, you know, street gang thug warfare. Now, right. I'm from upstate New York. I, you know, I mean, I live That's in right. Brooklyn now, but I live in the Jewish and Chinese neighborhood. I'm not really subjected to, you know, that particular lifestyle. So that said, I just had to kind of wing it. Uh, I got into it through a, um, Joel Maximo got me hooked up with the with the uh, with the promoter and. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I just tried to go out, and then, you know, the, the first thing you want me to do is swing a garbage can at a guy's head, which, again, is just not something I normally do, but I smacked the death out of him, I tell you that. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> no, it, it, that was a unique experience. I, you know, it would be fun to do it again now that I have a more conceptual grasp of what they're trying to approach, you know, because it was, it was just, you know, over my head. Obviously, I stuck out by, you know, not being the – their uh, cookie cutter ideology. I mean, I, you know, like I said earlier, I'm a classically trained wrestler, and here I'm trying to be right. a thug. But, well, uh, well, I, it was, it was, <laughs> well I, I just have to ask was there some type of initiation? I mean, did you have to drink a 40? Did you have to shoot guns in the air? You, you know, how, like, like, how does it work? I'm black, so I can understand. So it's all good. I can, I can say this and not get in trouble. So, you know, I was just wondering did you have to, you know, did you have to learn some signs? You know, the pound, pound, flip, flip, you know, two uh, snaps. How did it work? Uh, well, thankfully, they didn't ask me to drink a Fowdy at all. <laughs> I don't if you combine my total amount of alcohol in my life, I don't think I got to have 32 and a half ounces of alcohol. But that's, that's oh, good time. for you! You're so so pure and wholesome. Well, I didn't know they still meet you. Uh, yeah. James is going to get jealous. I think. Oh, you know, wow. I think I just, I just got by on the fact that I've I've done. I've wrestled on, I think, six or seven different promoters' pay-per-views. I, I've lost track. You know, I all-star, I don't even know how many guys I've worked for, but I think they just, they said, okay, we'll throw it, you know, because honestly, they didn't want to use me at first because I, you know, I was established as a as a character somewhere else. So, but mm-hmm. I was more, I was flexible right. to what they wanted to do. I changed my gimmick name to Team yeah. Mizzle, which, yes. uh, which is, I think, <laughs> My own invention, holla! So, bravo, <laughs> bravo! <laughs> you know, so I just I went with it. I tried to have fun, and I certainly did. It was unique. Yeah. Uh, obviously, those uh, w- w- those thug dancer girls they were they were making oh. the day go by easier. Yeah, know? they were hot. Oh, well, yeah, I can talk I about that all day long. Time, but that's another conversation. Oh, don't get me started! Oh my God, you got to start some trouble. Okay, okay, can I just say really quick? Bad weave, but a fat ass. So it was a fifty fifty. <laughs> no doubt. Oh, oh, I'm a bad person. I'm sorry. 
think, oh, I think we've lost complete control right now. <laughs> <laughs> but let's see in all seriousness, uh, it was it was great to see you wrestle VWS, but then I also went to both, um, ex- well, I guess Extreme Reunion and Extreme Rising. And uh, the wow. funny thing is I remember the first um, Extreme Reunion match more because I thought it was it was I thought it was very good from what I remember and hilarious at the same time. Um, I love how you guys were no nonsense and they tried to do the dance. You know, see, uh, I think it was, was this, no, 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 was it Meaty? Meaty was in the ring, I think, and. Yeah. Um, um, Jesus, I can't remember saying that Guido. And I know yeah. me started dancing. It was time for Guido. Guido didn't even try. He just like punched him in the face. <laughs> yeah. And you know that was that was great. You know, so I really enjoyed it. Look forward to the to the show November seventeenth, I believe. Mm-hmm. So I'll be there. We All that good stuff. The show. I want you to come up to me at at the at the middle of the show, and I will give you a free picture just because you've been so cool. Oh well, yeah, y'all. Oh, this is tape, so you can't take that back. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> the immortalized. Come, come say hello to Tony Mamalu. All right. Uh, all right, no doubt. In case you, I don't know if you know or not, but uh, Yolanda runs uh, Gimmicks Tees, which is a uh, oh, he's so sweet. Really cool T-shirts at uh, different events. You can buy yeah. them. Yeah, oh, all right. So, so have you seen a Future Endeavor T-shirt? Not the one WWE stole from me, cocksuckers. Um, I did it first, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Tony was worried about St. Bastard earlier. In- oh, well. <laughs> we have lost complete control of this show. Thank you for calling in, Yolanda. You're, You're welcome. Job. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Uh, uh, she actually did call uh, in after the first the Extreme uh, reunion, and, and she really praised it. She really had a good time. She wasn't just saying like I'm glad. On here. I'm glad. Mm-hmm. that's ultimately what the point was. Yeah, I think people got the misunderstanding of what... Extreme re- Reunion really was about and what Extreme Rising is about. Extreme Reunion, reunion excuse me, was about trying to remember some great moments. Extreme Rising is about creating some new ones. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, might, from the outskirts of it, looking at it, uh, you know, subjectively might think it's about a bunch of old has-beens or never-wers that are trying to get a payday. But for me personally... I can tell you it's because, you know, for one, I'm not one of the older guys uh, in the group. You know, I still have some years left under me. And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, be a part of capturing that magic that made what ECW was great and then making something new out of that inspiration. So, mm-hmm. I you know, that's that's really what Extreme Rising is. It's not It's not... It's not a bunch, it's not like the Eagles coming back around for uh, the umpteenth reunion tour just so that they can get a payday mm-hmm. and charge too much for a ticket. It's not about, you know, that type of thing. It's about trying to recapture what was brilliant about ECW, which was the organic nature of things, which was capturing the energy from the crowd and then manifesting that into entertaining matches. And that's really what I'm trying to do. And I know that's what Guido's trying to do. TV and everybody else, really, quite frankly. And that's what Shane's vision is, and that's what we are trying to obtain. Yeah. Now, you know, earlier when you said you kind of regret not uh, doing things differently when you're in Ring of Honor, um, now that you, the, you, what you just said about Extreme Rising, does that ever go through kind of your head the same kind of way? Like maybe you want to show different uh, different talents of yourself now in Extreme Rising instead of just, you know, the, the thing where everyone expects from you? Exactly, and that's if you, I don't know if you saw my last show for Extreme Rising, the Philly show, but you know mm-hmm. I, I I tried a different hairstyle and you know going with a different gear look and you know even a different uh, offensive skill set level instead of just being Tony Mamaluke who bumps around and gets killed and then nobody cares because it's Tony Mamaluke as long as Guido hits the home run and then we scoop. Uh, I'm trying to reinvent myself because. You know, you have to do that. One of the better guys at doing that, you know, was in fact Shane Douglas and, you know, even Steve Carino too for that matter, uh, being able to reinvent themselves on the fly. And, you know, I've had to kind of come to terms that, you know, this is going to be the time to either do it or not do it. So, uh, you know, I've been rededicating myself to all the things that you need to do in order to, you know, be good in this business. You know, I'm training every week to get to school, to well school. You know, I, I'm dedicating myself to the gym. You know, I'm eating right, working hard, and 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 studying the business, studying the, you know, my uh, 
you know, my inspiration and my muse is Dean Malenko and just really <clears throat> throwing myself at it 100%. And uh, I think, you know, I can feel myself getting better and I think I look better and I just want to continue that path wherever it takes me, hopefully somewhere uh, where the money is good. Uh, mm -hmm. That's my goal. What do you think is different about Extreme Rising where uh, – what different things can someone like showcase there that maybe they can't showcase on like a different, you know, uh, big independent promotion? You know, that's a good question. I, you know, Shane handpicks, you know, with along with the other booking members, uh, individuals that can bring something to the table that isn't brought to the table already. In other words, you know, what was great about the original ECW is that everybody had a niche, and Paul Heyman's brilliance wasn't, uh, you know making stars it was having stars make themselves by what they do best and then accentuating that and hiding their flaws and um i think what shane's trying to do is is kind of find guys that bring something different and unique to the table and then allowing them the opportunity to do that without the cluster like when you go to an indie show there's 5000 guys in the back that are going to fly around before the main event and that's why every main event is is unless the guys, you know, light the other guy on fire and throw him off the roof and, you know, somebody damn near dies, so you're not going to get a pop because people are tired because they've seen everything. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be a, you know, an old school approach because what's old is new again, is building two certain parts of the show and then taking it down and then building it back up and then doing it again and on and on until you have been able to put everybody in a place where they have their own little segment in the show and they can, they can uh, have that moment unto themselves and not trying to compete with the guy in front and behind, but working together. And that's what a wrestling show should be. It shouldn't be a, off, uh, an athletic exhibition of big moves and see how many different unique ways we can dump somebody on their head and then they kick out. It should be about being able to create your character, develop it, and have its own place in the show. Mm -hmm. we, That's what Shane's trying to do. We brought up actually a couple when we had different, I think maybe even when we had Shane on, was uh, a lot of the like bigger indies right now. I kind of think you have to be kind of like you're saying like a real big high flyer to have a place on the card, like Dragon yeah. Gate or even Ring of Honor. I think right now. So, but there's a lot of guys that that have different things they they can stand out with. And to me, when you're watching a wrestling uh, show, you want all different things. You don't just want want all the same matches. It, that's what's exciting right. about it. Exactly, because if you have all the same matches, you know, that's why baseball is not as popular as football, because once a week you watch football, mm. and you wait all... You have your own team, and you're rooting for that team, and there's, you're vested in that team. Or you're just a general fan, and you're wanting to see certain stars from other teams and teams that are really good play each other. Whereas baseball, they play 162 times a year. I mean, if you watch baseball every single night, you're going to get bored. I don't care who you are, because it's the same thing every night. Nine innings, two pitchers, 27 outs, both mm -hmm. sides. You know, you can like I you can watch a Yankee game, miss three weeks, and go back and not miss a damn thing. Now, in wrestling, you need unique combination of personalities because if everyone is the same, then it's just it's like watching baseball. You can miss a match and not care about the people that are in it. Because all you're really interested in at that point is the moves that they're doing and not the people that are doing the moves. Mm -hmm. And that's where wrestling has lost its way. Because all we, what we see now is especially younger guys on the indie scene who don't understand the concept of working, getting over, and making money, is they're just trying to see what cool move they can pull off because they're glorified marks. And that's all that they understand because there's not a, a group of people that are taking them and teaching them the business. Because in my generation, I was like one of the last generations where there was that old school hand-me-down approach of the time-honored traditions. And now it's just more or less, uh, it's like watching drag racing and they go 125,000 miles an hour and no one remembers anything because it's just so much. It's like watching an action movie and there's too many stunts. You just don't remember everything because everything got blown up. Right. It's not stuff explosions, <laughs> like the Transformers. <laughs> yeah, Although that's a terrible example because that made a lot of money. But, uh... I love Transformers. <laughs> All right, interesting question. I'm a part of Transformers. You are really. 
Can't oh, say I was a big fan of the Transformers toys, but uh, not oh. a big fan of the movie. <laughs> Dude, they can do no wrong in my eyes. Nor can the Smurfs. But that's a you know that's. I'm from the '80s for crying out loud. <laughs> I am too. I think I'm a year older than you actually, but uh. <laughs> uh born in '76. Yeah, you are a little older than me. Well, I always thought they, I always thought they should make a GoBots movie for sci-fi, like a sci-fi original GoBots. Nah, nah, GoBots were fly-by-nighters. Come on, man. Well, that's why it would be perfect for Even sci-fi. As a kid, I knew they were they were secondhand. Yeah. That's on, why it's man. perfect for sci-fi original. Just throw some CGI GoBots in there. That'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> now the show's coming up November seventeenth, and again, you don't know who you're wrestling. But somebody who uh, made their uh, debut last time, and I'm just wondering what uh, what your thoughts on him is, uh, Matt Hardy. Personally, I I, uh, I enjoy it. any time I get to to see Matt Hardy. It's always a good time for me. He's always been a class act, real nice guy to me ever since long before you know he should have been to me. Uh, you know, one would think, uh, and I just hope that on a personal level, and you know, and the professional level, that he is getting things right and that he will be back to being Matt Hardy, the you know, kind of the really good guy that uh loves wrestling and and respects the business and has always treated it that way. You know, I know he went through some some difficult months there, you know, it was a real it was a real struggle to, to see that take place, uh, for me personally. And, you know, I'm not even a close friend with him, but, you know, it was tough because I know he's a good guy. So I hope he's got everything moving forward in the right direction now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I always defend him on the show. I, I think he's, uh, as some people love the guy, some people hate him. It's kind of really no in between, but I'm always a fan of him. And I think he's like a perfect guy for the company because no matter what, he gets people talking about him. Well, I mean, you, need, you know, Matt Hardy's going to sell tickets. You know, people might not want to admit that out loud, but this is a guy that drew big money a long time. Mm-hmm. I mean, this guy and his brother, you know, they they were one of the, the two two of the biggest stars in the business when the business was hot. So, um, and that wasn't really that long ago, you know. And mm-hmm. he just kind of fell out of favor. He could still be on TV right now if things were a little bit different. And uh, there's, it, it would not shock me if in the relative near future that was the case for him again. So he can definitely bring a lot to anybody's company. It really can. Now, is there anybody from the original ECW that um, maybe isn't or doesn't do many comebacks now that you would like to see uh, make a return? Interesting. It's a bit of an obscure one, and it's it, and it's only really because I'm a personal. The, the original. The, no. Bless his heart. <laughs> Almighty. Not the musketeer. Oh, yeah. I tell you, I don't want to see come back ever in life. It's uh, not a jet. <laughs> <laughs> is there a personal story there, or just uh, you were just not a fan uh, of the character? Or? Well, let me just say, she was maybe the worst driving partner. No, not maybe, but absolutely the worst driving partner I've ever had in my life. Mm-hmm. And if I really, she then there got me arrested in Texas. She never drove more at night ever. I did all the driving, and she wanted to stop every other five minutes to eat because she was a bodybuilder. Oh my god, the <laughs> worst! You can't try. Listen, you, you listen. You cannot. You cannot just. I drove my own car for fifteen thousand miles in three months on my own dime in ECW. Mm-hmm. I never. I mean, she never drove the, the car. I did all the driving, and all she did was eat and, and point out that there were cows on the side of the road. Unbelievable. <laughs> I can't stand her. And if she ever hears this, I want her to know that it's fact. And I'm not just saying saying that for posterity's sake. She is the worst traveling partner that has ever walked the face of the earth. <laughs> oh, my God. You don't even know. I won't even I won't even explain why I really dislike her. <laughs> Other than the fact that if I did tell you, you'd want to smack her too. <laughs> now to answer your question, uh, if I could have one ECW guy come back, this goes way back before the Dudleys were really over. But mm-hmm. the original Dudley is Dudley Dudley, Jeff Bradley, mm-hmm. and he was 
an instrumental part in my learning the wrestling game. He, he was the the uh, the trainer when Dean wasn't there. So I learned a lot from Jeff Bradley on how to wrestle and a lot more on what this business really is all about. So if anyone could come back uh, for maybe a spot show and some you know type of deal, it'd be great to see Jeff Bradley. But I, I doubt if anyone even remembers Deadly Dudley. But if they do, he was a tremendous wrestler. Very underrated. I remember him. I was, I was, I graduated in 94, so I was a huge ECW fan back, back in the day. Wow. You're the man. <laughs> you still, you used to come on a, at 2 a.m. Huh? What was that? We could, we'll get a write-in campaign for Dudley Dudley. <laughs> I think we'll start the, you used to come on 2 a.m. on the Spanish channel here. And, uh, that I, had to night. To I had to wait till 4 a.m. and sometimes I'd fall asleep or it was preempted. Oh, that was the worst. I used, to, I, would pro- I mean, there's no way I would do this now. But at the time, I remember what you know when uh, it got canceled for, from there. Was, you know, near the end of ECW, and uh, I called the Spanish channel, like asked why it wasn't on. Like, I can't imagine me do being like like that into a wrestling company today to do that. But I, I was like, I was really upset. Oh. <laughs> well, see, now that's the thing, and, and mm-hmm. this is why CW was great, is because we're talking about a company that closed what twelve years ago. 11 and a half years ago, you know, whatever. And people are still talking about it with that same kind of passion. You know, and, uh, you know, if we can we can capture that on some level Mm -hmm. with extreme rising, then we really have something there. We don't have to make it ECW again, but we want to capture that energy. That's Mm -hmm. the whole thing. I said similar thing on the show a bunch of times was I think sometimes people think of ECW and they just they're just like fixated on you know hardcore and whatever but really I think the biggest part of it was you were really emotionally attached to it like you really wanted to see it do well you wanted to see all the stars do well like those were your guys and right. uh, I don't think any company really has that going for it right now and I think that's something that you like you said you'd want to learn from the old ECW and and do today. If well, there was, there was there was a grittiness about it, uh, kind of, yeah. uh, you know, kind of almost like that, that kind of, you know, like underground uh, kind of thing. Underground, exactly, like an unsigned label or unsigned band that was really good, and no mm-hmm. one knows about them, and then people started talking about them, and you wanted to be there when it started, and you wanted to see it flourish, and then you know, obviously because of the economics of it all unfortunately that didn't happen but it didn't mean that what was done in those what eight or nine years wasn't just amazing and wonderful and and just quite frankly a beautiful exhibition of entertainment Mm -hmm. you know being a fan of ecw yourself before you got into it like when you were when you actually were wrestling there like your first time like what was just that experience like you know, I didn't really feel exceptionally excited, mm-hmm. but, but let me explain that. It, it wasn't, I wasn't overwhelmed by the, the event because very easily I was just taken into the family, and that's what ECW's locker room was, was really a family. And I wasn't made to feel like I was an outsider trying to make it. I was taken in. And, and brought into the fold in ECW and treated like I'd always been there. So it was fun. It wasn't overwhelming. It wasn't, I, it felt like I was there my whole life and I wish it was there of my, I wish I was there my whole life. It was really, it was the most at peace I'd ever been in wrestling and the most fun I've ever had in wrestling. So it was great. Mm-hmm. What was, uh, you know, me and Paul Heyman like? <laughs> I remember, well, you know, th- there's one thing that I did that was infamous in ECW, which is my first night there, and I'm sure if I bring it up, everyone has seen it, who cares, is when I did the flip and landed on the guardrail. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what got me my job, and I think Paul gave me the job because he was afraid I'd sue him, but the first thing he said to me, which I believe was in Pensacola, Florida, was, hey, you're that guy that landed on the guardrail. That was freaking amazing. Don't ever do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really interesting because I, I was a Paul E. fan before there was an ECW. Yeah. I always liked, I always liked it. Although when he wrestled Cornette in that kind of that tuxedo match, that was, <laughs> right. that was an abomination of, of the nth degree. But other than that 
horrible exhibition. I always was a fan of Paulie's. I always, you know, the whole 1990s. Yeah. Dangerous Alliance is one of the most underrated. Like, no one really talks about that. That was an awesome faction. Yeah, you know, I think they came along when, obviously, WWE was just running running the deal at that point. Mm-hmm. But, nah, you know, and they were also the rebound effect of the Four Horsemen. So it was kind of like a resistance, as it were, from from that as well. But the, certainly the talent in that faction was amazing, you know. I, I mean, honestly, you know, ravishing Rick Rude. Maybe, believe it or not, one of the more underrated of all time when you think about who yeah. was the real great. That guy was absolutely an amazing wrestler. Mm-hmm. And he could be great in any era. He could be great right now. Oh, yeah. He really took, like, big bumps for, you know, pretty big. I also think some people don't think of him as a big guy because he's slender, but he's a pretty big guy. And he, would, he took one of yeah. the best back bumps I've ever seen. I mean, uh, backdrops I've ever seen. Yeah, I was just I just watched I think it was Clash of Champions and it was him and Sting. He took like a ridiculous back. Yeah. Unbelievable. What a great worker. Mm-hmm. That was oh, awesome really when, when they debuted him in the group and uh he had like the, the Phantom of the Opera mask. I was, mean all those guys were real good, you know. Yeah. All of them. I remember that War Games was a lot of was really cool. I still remember that. Some stuff that happens last week I don't remember, but I remember the War Games with them and and Larry Sabisco hurts his arm and then he becomes a baby face. And yeah, that's pretty yeah, good stuff. No doubt, man. No doubt. Well, that's because booking now is is. I mean, there's there's nothing interesting going on. I mean, mm. the only thing that's interesting in wrestling is when some guy that used to be interesting comes back and has a spot show. I mean, you know, honestly, that's because the guys that are on TV right now aren't really generating that kind of, you know... Why do you think that is? Well, um, I totally agree with you. We pretty much agree with you. Well, you know, in the, in the old days, you, you took 10 years to really learn the craft, and then you took five years to really establish your character, and then the next 10 or 12 is when you made your money. Now you've got guys who were former athletes in different af- avenues who are being thrown on TV, who haven't, first of all, aren't even really wrestling fans, so you don't have that innate understanding of what entertains because you're not entertained by it yourself. And then you don't have enough time to develop your your skill set, your character, and then learn how to make money because there's no one, A, to teach you because the guy that's in, in front of you is as lack, lacking in understanding as you are, and B, because there's just too much TV, oversaturation of the product, and there's no diversity within it, so it's just bland and boring. Mm-hmm. Uh, it looks like bodybuilders who, you know, didn't make it in football, and now they're trying to make money in another athletic event, and it's mm-hmm. not entertaining. I as think, far as TNA yeah. goes, they mm-hmm. just don't have a true... They're they're not connecting with the fans because they they don't know how to develop their characters. The talent is very good. The matches are fun. But they don't have that ability to connect. Yeah, they don't, don't grab your attention. They just, you know, even AJ Styles, who's tremendous and talented, he might be the only one that really connects with the fans. But I don't know if he's doing that on a national level. Yeah. Not that I can do it either, but I'm not sure. I don't know. There's always something about him to me that because a lot of people do uh, springboards and all this stuff, but I don't know. There's something that he's got like a ring presence. I think that really does like capture you. Um, no, it's yeah, it's not him that's not doing it right. It's just the mm-hmm. way they present the product. It's not allowing him to fully be able to capture the minds and, and imagination. Like yeah. Bret Hart, I just watched Bret Hart and Stone Cold from 1996 at WrestleMania, and that was a fight. But the mm-hmm. reason it was a fight is because the buildup and the and the and actual payoff were captivating television. Oh, yeah. Where those guys had time to come up in the business, create their characters, establish them amongst the fans, create diversity within the, the two characters, and were able to tell a story bouncing off of those characters. And you just don't have that in wrestling because there's too much TV. Mm-hmm. This, you know, that's fun as a fan, too, because to, I watched Stone Cold well, Austin when he was in World Class and then... And then w, I don't know. It's just there's something about watching someone progress like throughout their career, yeah. and then finally become this. It's like it really. I think kind of like the last guy to do that was like 
uh, Jeff Hardy, because I kind of remembered him as like kind of like a job guy and just slowly uh-huh. going up the, the card, and oh, there's something special there, instead yeah, of someone just debuting winning the title. Exactly. And Kevin Nash alluded to this in an interview. It's exactly what I was saying. Is I'm really reiterating his points because they're accurate, uh, in spite of his, what he said about Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit. <laughs> yeah. That being said, you know, it's, you know, what you're talking about is exactly the point. Like, you get to grow with the character. It's like when you see, uh, you know, a kid in college that was a good football player and then you, fly, or, you know, even like LeBron James. I've watched LeBron James progress into the greatest player in the world. And, uh, that has been fun. And as a fan for me of him, that has been fun to take that ride with him. Mm-hmm. Whereas now, get thrown this guy and say, okay, now you have to like this guy because he does cool moves. Well, you like the cool moves, but you don't know anything about the guy. Yeah. Exactly. Um, let's see. We got Taz of the Greek calling in. I believe he's he's in Brooklyn, I think. Hey, Tony, how you doing? How you doing? <laughs> I'm good, man. I'm doing good. Uh, I got a couple of questions to ask you. I hope you don't mind. Um, thanks for taking my call. Jack Inter, how you guys doing? Doing great. All right. <laughs> So, are you a real Guido? Yes, right? <laughs> half, yes. <laughs> all right, so... I'm half right, two so, uh, times, though, if you care. You? No, you're not. Yes, I am. My, fa- my father's full, full time, half time. Go on. Stop it. Stop it's true. Um, what Why do you think like? about Robbie E? Okay. The, the gimmick and, and the wrestler and... I'm not sure... What are you really asking me about, Robbie? You want to know about him personally, or you... <laughs> are you asking about that, that, that whole like the whole, uh, uh, just that whole kind of Guido type thing? Of the whole Jersey Shore thing. Okay. Oh, what do I think of the character? Yeah, the Jersey right. Shore thing and all that. So not just Robbie I... himself, just the Jersey Shore in general. Or... I, I guess what you're asking me is if do I appreciate the way pe- Italians are being perpetra- uh, portrayed on television as, as being kind of ignorant and, and, and boastful? Uh, I'm not asking you that, but okay, why not? Sure. <laughs> uh, well, to answer that question, I guess, I, I'm not really, I don't find that to be entertaining, and I, you know, it's insulting in many respects. As far as Robbie Yee goes, I think he's a young kid with a tremendous look that if he's given the opportunity he could be maybe pretty good one day. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of development there that I think needs to take place, not physically, but just, uh, you know, getting, you know, he's a you're really young guy. He just needs some time to really develop and, uh, you know, learn how to really be a star, which is not something you're born with. So, I mean, you might know how to, but you need to be taught exactly how to. I think he's got potential, uh, but who knows? What do you think about him, Tazo? I kind of like him. I, I, what sucks there is every time, like when they first brought him in, I thought it was terrible. Then, like I started to like him with uh, with the bodyguard, and they were doing the they had the rope, and then it just disappears every time. Like something starts to gain a little bit of momentum, it just disappears from TV. And it's hard to get well, anything that way. Well, that's politics and wrestling for you. It's somebody from the outside getting over the guys who are there want you on the outside. Mm-hmm. I know Danny Doring when we had him on, he really hates the the Jersey Shore. I, to be honest with you, I have never watched a full episode. I've watched, I think, parts of, if you combine the total amount of minutes, maybe 10 to 15, and I find it to be just, first of all, I find it to be fake, and the whole concept of reality TV is an insult because there's no reality in the TV shows. I think they're all contrived. That's where wrestling gets a bad, you know, kind of like view, like, okay, at least we let you in on the deal. I mean, after all these years, we finally let you in on the on on the gimmick. Whereas all these shows from MTV is trying to. I don't know. First of all, I could care less if some 16 year old girl was pregnant, and the fact that you put her on TV is making it more of a glorification of a profound lack of judgment. And then you have these idiot teenagers, uh, some of whom are not the the, the snooky kid who's not even really Italian who are going around portraying Italians as being moronic, I mean, that's insulting. Now, if that was another ethnicity, God forbid there's the fallout from that. I mean, honestly, if you think, you know, from that perspective, but the fact that they're portraying ignorant 
Italians, I guess that's funny on some level. And it's not entertaining. That, it's just, you know, I mean, how is that? If that's entertaining to you, if that really is entertaining to you, then you're seriously lacking any real excitement in your life. Yeah. I've honestly never watched it. But what sucks is I can never escape it because it's a, they always want to bring bring the stars on, on my wrestling programs. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, these people are. But that just that just furthers my point that it's a total work. Mm -hmm. It's total. It's a total, absolute, total and complete work outside of exactly what they're telling them to say. Is the funny thing? I guess the funny part of reality TV is the quote unquote organic reactions that people have to each other. But I mean, I could care less about NBA how, uh, wives and, or housewives of whatever large city that no one. Lived in, right. so they got to, you know, give me a break. I could care less about these people. Mm. I mean, what happened to times when people used to write things on paper and people used to talk them out loud? I mean, really? Is that so hard? Why did we deviate from the from what was working for 50-odd years? I don't know. On the opposite of that, uh, what do you think about uh, uh, scripting all the promos in wrestling? I hate it, and it sucks, mm. because now you're not... A, you're not letting people be themselves or creating the character. You're trying to fit the character into a mold, and most people in wrestling don't have the skill set to be professional actors. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why when wrestlers, by and large, go and do real movies, they're not entertaining because they really don't have that skill. They're doing their glorified version of their personality as opposed to you know, somebody else's personality. Now, when you write everything down, it comes across as lame, fake, and contrived, and that's why wrestling sucks. What made wrestling great was the thin line between, that was blurred between, is this real or is it not? And as mm -hmm. long as you have that line, then people will keep coming back to your show. Mm -hmm. I know uh, Jericho and I think Jericho and Foley said, too, that's uh, how both of those and other people, like Rose in wrestling, because they knew how to to uh, you know, think of their own promos and then deliver them. And if they were around today, it would be different because unless they really liked you and then wrote some for you, you wouldn't have anything, and you'd right. have to be saying some else stuff. Plus, I think, let's say you are a good writer and you can write a Mick Foley promo, but I don't think you could necessarily then also write a Ric Flair promo and a Jericho promo. I mean, you probably have like a certain style that you're not necessarily going to be able to write for every character. Can Can you just imagine? Can you just imagine what it would have been like? for some sniveling kid who just graduated from writing school to walk up to Ric Flair and tell him how to be the world champion. Yeah. Are you serious? Well, You're talking about maybe the greatest promo guy in the history of the business that will 20 years from now be still glorified as being great. And you're going to tell me that some kid who's A, not a wrestling fan, and B, is not even 30, is going to tell some guy who's been in the business for 15 years already Mm -hmm. How to do the business? It's an insult to the guys who are doing the wrestling. Mm -hmm. The people who should be in charge are those who used to be in the ring, because you know that's why NBA coaches, by and large, are ex-players. Right. They play. They understand. And baseball managers too. How many managers in baseball are former catchers? Right. Because they understand what it takes to win, and they understand how to prevent losing, by and large. Now, that might not always happen, but at least they know how to do that. So if you know how to wrestle, then you know how to entertain, and you know what is actually going to get over, as opposed to some kid who's throwing something at the wall and hoping it sticks. But I'm not Vince McMahon, so I'm not hiring anybody, and the least of which is Tony Mamaluke. So what do I know? I know just as a fan, uh, pretty much every time there's been like a great promo in the last 10 years or so, it usually kind of comes out that it was something that that particular talent like thought of on their own. Exactly, because it's organic. And, again, it all goes back to being organic. And by organic, I mean it's a natural occurring uh, set of circumstances that created that great moment. You know, like when Mick Foley got thrown off the cage and went through the table, I'm sure they had a plan, but, that I mean, that was organic. No one can recreate that because if they tried, they'd probably kill somebody. Mm. I mean, when you're talking about when the Warrior and Hulk Hogan faced off at, at uh, was it Royal Rumble, that had an organic feel to it. Although it was set up, the way that it was portrayed 
was organic. When Ric Flair won the 1992 Royal Rumble, which I was in the building for, that was an unbelievable organic moment. And because it was those guys going out there and doing what they do best and not being told 10,000 things before they do it, and none of them coming off at all talent around any kind of level of talent that's interesting. You just, I mean, the wrestling just it sucks because it's overthought. It's, it's very easy. Wrestling is a very easy way to entertain people. You have good, you have evil, they clash, good wins. Mm. Very simple. That's a good point, too. Lots of times, um, I mean, you just want to see someone beat somebody, or for, either for title or the like, but a lot of times uh, when they start adding, like, so many, uh, just so many ideas and it gets more out there. Like, I don't think that ever adds to it. It usually takes away from what you're watching. Yeah. I mean, I mean, a really good promotion is something that fans can first, they can believe in and two, they can trust. You know, when that, that's what killed Vince Russo is that no one could trust his booking because every time they would get behind the character, that character would turn heel or that character would, would I don't know, come across in a totally different direction. Like, I mean, why is Mike Awesome dressed up like a 1970s buffoon? I have no idea. Just let Mike Awesome be Mike Awesome. Mm -hmm. Why is he throwing people off of a bus? Why do you have guys who are rappers who are clowns wrestling guys who are wrestlers and beating them? Why do you have a a professionally trained movie star winning a world title? No one can buy into that. Not even the most naive fan is going to believe that David Arquette is a world champion. But if he wins the title, then you have just thrown the entire locker room under the bus, and then you lit the bus on fire, and everybody died. Mm-hmm. And you wonder why you can't get the show over, because you've killed all the characters. When you, when you, when you, don't, let the, when you don't allow the fans to trust your product, they will turn away in mass. Because they're not going to waste their time watching something that they know ultimately they're going to be disappointed in seeing. Mm-hmm. Did Did you work with uh, when you were there? Was Vince Russo in charge? Oh God, yes. Well, it was, so, a, well, catastrophic, it yeah. was a catastrophic. It was a abject failure. It was. Mm-hmm. There's no other way to describe it. He is the worst person that ever walked in wrestling. He's the worst guy that has ever been in the business. Now, is he on a personal level, or do I believe that? No, obviously not. There's way yeah. worse guy. But on a professional level, he is the worst thing that ever... He was able to kill one of the most prominent co- companies in the history of the business. I mean, even in their worst-case scenario, if they would have just slowed down the nonsense, they'd still be around today. Mm-hmm. I, honestly, somebody would have bought that company and had it going for a, forever. <laughs> It's mm-hmm. very easy to make money. He just took every idea in wrestling. What he did and why he sucks the most is he took everything in wrestling, all the rules, and he systematically broke them all. One by one by one. And did it in front of your face and laughed at you while he did it. He spit on the entire business for 50 years before it. He insulted everybody that ever cared about the business and everybody who ever was in the business. And if I ever see him personally, I'm going to punch him square in the chest so hard that he can't breathe. And then I'm going to poke his eyes. And we will applaud. But why, what is it? Why does he always get so many, like, shots? And, like, was it TD? Like, what is it about him? I, I have no earthly clue. Why did TNA give him a job for us? I have no idea. I have no idea. I have heard some people defend him saying some of the stuff he writes is good. Well, if some of the stuff you write is good and all of the rest of the stuff you write is horrible, then that stuff that you wrote is good will be just sucked up into the rest of the other stuff that was terrible. He wrote some of the stupid... Are you kidding me? He made a guy go out there and pretend to be J.R. with Bell Palsy. I mean, unbelievable. Really? Are you serious? You know, you, I mean, I, you, unbelievable. Well, I can never, like, even if you give him the benefit of the doubt that when he was in, in WWF, like, let's say every while he was there, everything that was on TV, let's say that was all his, whatever, you know, you can argue that or not, but let's just say it was, but everything every he's ever done since then has been, like, this total failure. 
I don't know why like people just keep hiring him and keep okay. him there for yes, so long. But see, at the end of the day, no matter what happens in WWE, Vince McMahon will write off, sign off on it. Mm-hmm. All things go through Vince. So for all the great ideas that Russo came up with, there were thousands of other ideas that were thrown away because they sucked. And then when he went to WCW, there was no one there to curtail his insanity and stupidity. So he just took every idea he could think of, no matter how absurd, and was able to put it on TV because everyone had drank the Kool-Aid on this fly-by-night clown who had systematically set the business back, I would say, maybe four decades because of his terrible, terrible exhibition. And he is the worst writer, promoter, booker of all time. And there is no one even close. I'd, I, I, would, I would venture to guess that in a hundred years from now, when you're talking on the wrestling almanac, and you've got a picture of the worst booker of all time, if it is anyone other than Vince Russo, <laughs> I would be shocked. But first of all, I wouldn't be alive. But I would be shocked into cardiac arrest and die on the spot. If, this is, if, if he is not the worst, I have, I have no idea how you could be worse. I have no concept. What could you do that could be worse? I, I have no idea. Yeah. He just, he just, watch the show. <laughs> Go back and watch that stuff. Uh-huh. And ask yourself if you should be sober doing it in order to get entertained by it. <laughs> You're going to get no arguments from us uh, on no. this one. <laughs> uh, Taza, did you have anything else? Yeah, I was uh, going to ask. Tony, if um, uh, I was lucky to uh, see a uh, see you at a, um, a show in uh, Rockaway Beach uh, for the uh, Fighting Spirit Wrestling promotion. Oh, okay, all right. Which and, time? Um, uh, Rockaway Beach, uh, like a few months ago. The first time or the second time? I'm going to assume the second time. All right, all right. Uh, and um, well, I, I noticed, you know, a lot of these, I'm, I'm like 43, right? So I'm an old guy. I see all these young kids, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, right? Uh, well, I guess my question is, do these, uh, do you get a lot of kids coming up to you and asking for advice, basically? I'm sorry, do I get he a lot of them asking? He wants, yeah, you want to know if uh, any young uh, wrestlers come up asking you for advice. Yeah, right. what kind of advice Every do you day. Yeah, all, all the time. Yeah, and I... I would dare say I don't mind giving it, whether it's right or wrong. Oh, all the time. Thank God for that, because that's how wrestling used to be. You had a guy that has been around a while. You ask him questions how you can be around a while, and then you stay around a while. So, yes, thankfully, some of the guys, a lot of the guys in Fighting Spirit, it's kind of a smaller group that Joel's trying to, trying to get going. Uh, you know, they, they, they come into business. They've been taught the right way by Joel Maximo. And, uh, and to some extent, even myself, because I train down there and, and, you know, show them some things. So, But any show that I go to, I, uh, there's always some guy that's going to ask me a question. And I love answering these questions because, you know, I might not ever make it to the big time again. And the time that I was there wasn't that big of a time anyway. But the fact that if I can pass on the business to the next level, the next generation – and they can take it and make it better than where it was when they found it. That's all wrestling should ever be about. You find it and try to make it better before you leave. I am having a very difficult time doing that, as just about every major company that was around when I started is now out of business, and all the guys that were in it are now either dead or gone. So my business, the way it is right now, is certainly a lot worse off than the way I found it. Along those lines, um when, when you know, when you're at different places and you see someone young you think has a lot of uh, potential or not, uh, now that you're with Extreme Rising, would you, uh, you know, maybe you put a good word in for him or like to see him, you know, work for, for Extreme Rising? Oh, absolutely, if I find the right guy. Because mm-hmm. uh, that's what wrestling was about, too. When I started, people would put a good word in for me, and that's how I got my name around there, at least in Florida. Because, you know, Florida is old school when it comes to, or at least it used to be, it was a bunch of old guys that did the same territories for years and years and years, and they weren't inviting you into their party. You had to just kind of force your way in, and the only way to do that is to be a good wrestler. So once they saw that, then they, you know, you 
say, okay, this guy's good, so I'm going to put my name to him and say, okay, you should use this guy because he's good because I said he was good. And then when that happens and you do right by the promoter and the guys that put in a word for you, then you start getting your name out there instead of going on the Internet and telling everybody you're great because you do flips and twists that other people can't, uh, but you don't know how to put a headlock on. You were mm-hmm. told, other people told you were good instead of you telling them. So, But, I, again, part of me is just being old school, but, you know, but that's how the business should be. You shouldn't just be able to step into the ring and get your name out there because you can't. You should be able to get your name out there because you did right by the people that did right by you. No, thanks for calling in, Tazo. You're a good man. Thanks a lot. Thanks for taking my call. Bye, guys. Bye. Well, we'll let everybody know November 17th, Turns of Philly, Extreme Rising. And the website, I believe, is still extremereunion.net. There's a link right on our website you can click on in case you can't spell, and it'll bring you there like magic. And uh, you can get. <laughs> You can get the uh, the last two shows on iPay-Per-View, at least the last one. I don't know if the first one's still on iPay-Per-View. I mean, you can pick up the DVD. And uh, I've seen both of them. I've really enjoyed them. And I'm looking forward to uh, this third one. Yeah, I think it's going to be even better than the other two, to be honest. Because now we understand. We caught our momentum out of Queens, got it going in, in Philly, and I think we're going to steamroll now. Well, we hope uh, we hope you find out who you're going to wrestle, but I don't think it matters. It's going to be entertaining either way. Well, that's the hope. <laughs> that's the hope. So that's the reality. That, that yeah. cool. All right, man. Uh, well, thank you for coming on. All right. Well, it was a lot of fun. I hope I didn't talk too much. No, it was oh, perfect. You got me going on all my hot button issues. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was. I'm kind of proud of myself because we had no preparation for the show. We didn't know who we were going to have on, so I think it turned out well. 